Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's a wonderful day outside. We had a little bit of fresh dusting of snow out there, so all the dirt and everything kind of gets covered over, and it's a really nice, clean look out there, and I kind of like that. Uh, not so much that you have to go out and shovel the snow and clean it off the windshield and everything uh, this morning, and, and got out there to do that, and that was a lot of fun, but uh, it's still a good time anyway, and, and we have something to look forward to today. Uh, something to really, really look right at. We've got about 75 days before all the snow goes away, and so, and we can start counting those days down, and, and warmer weather is sure to follow. So, uh, we have some things to look forward to today. And we just uh, want to thank everyone for coming in. We, uh, Pastor Terry and I met on Friday. We decided what our next movie is going to be. And uh, we haven't got the date nailed down for it yet right now, but uh, it's a movie called War Room. And it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. And uh, it's uh, one I'm really looking forward to. So uh, something to kind of whet your appetite on. We've got that coming up here. Um, that will be in March. So uh, every other month we're going to be doing this. So we've got to wait a little bit longer, but we got some things to look forward to starting in March, a little bit warmer weather, maybe melting back some of the snow and things and ice that we have, and, and an excellent, excellent movie. So looking forward to that. Well, let's go ahead and go into our time of worship this morning. And uh, we, we've got a lot of things, I think, to be thankful for this week and a lot of blessings that have come our way. We've had answered prayers, and we were talking about some of those things on Wednesday night. And, uh, we have to make sure that we count our blessings in amongst the trials that uh, we're facing at the times that we do. And, and so as we go to God this morning and opening up with a word of prayer here, I want you to think about those blessings that you do get and that you receive each and every day. So Father God, we just come before you this morning and here and we, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here together and, and to be one with you today. Lord, to lift up your word unto the people here, to give us those words of assurance, to give us those words that lift us up and edify us, Lord, and bring us closer in our relationship to you. And Lord, we just pray that we would have ears to hear these words today and to be able to take them into our hearts and put them into practice in our lives. And we pray all these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. So our call to worship this morning comes from John, and uh, Terry picked out 12 through 20, uh, 12, 25 through 26, and in there it says, those who love their life in this world will lose it, and those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me. Because my service must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. So that's, a, that's an excellent set of, of verses that we have today. And I want to step back just one more verse in here and add that in as well. And 24 says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of weed is planted in soil and dies... It remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And then it goes on in 25 and 26. Those who love their life in this world will lose it, and those who care nothing for this life in this world will keep it for eternity. And anyone who wants to serve me must follow me. Because my service must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. And you know, I got this, and I read it just moments before I had some news that uh, one of my friends passed away. And he was my former business partner as well. So we had a long-term connection starting back in about 1968 when we moved over to Cedar Hills. And see, that set my mind racing because I didn't bring him to the Lord. 
I shared my faith with him and, and he knew what it meant to me. But see, I didn't take it further. And this illustration that John is using here uses two different words in the Greek to describe the word life. And so this hit home for me yesterday as I was writing this and as I was thinking about what I could say about this and, and it just poured over me that, you know, we have to be able to plant the seed, but we can't make it grow. Only God can. See, our job is to plant the seeds. Our, our job is to tell the story that God wants these people to hear. It's up to them to receive it. It's up to them to take it into their heart. And so these words that John uses in here for the word life, the first one is sush, P-S-U-H-C-E. And see, that refers to our existence in this world and, and an exercise of our mind and our desires and of our will. And the second one that he uses in here in this illustration, in this passage, is zoe, Z-O-E. And it refers to that spiritual life, the eternal life of our spirits. So when we look at what that means for us today, if we pursue the materialistic things and the desires of this world, we will miss out on what God has planned for us. Just like that grain of wheat, we have to die to those things in order to be able to bear fruit in our spiritualistic life. My point here is people can only experience life and joy when they die to their self-centered existence and give control of their life over to Jesus. And sometimes they die before that becomes a realization. And that's really sad. And that is something I hope you never experience. Because we're there to be able to present that truth to them. We have to plant those seeds. They have to die to their existence. And in these passages, there's a duality of meaning in here. One for our personal lives, and at the same time, it's also a beautiful picture of the necessary sacrifice of Jesus. Unless that kernel of wheat is planted in the soil, it won't become that blade of wheat that produces more seeds. And Jesus had to die to pay the penalty for our sin. But see, at the same time, it shows that he has that power over death. His resurrection proves he has eternal life. And because Jesus is God, Jesus can give this same eternal life to all of us who believe in him. We must be so committed for living for Christ that we care nothing for our lives in this world by comparison. And this doesn't mean that we long to die or that we live a careless and destructive life for the life that God has given us. But it means that we have to be willing to die to our self-centeredness, die to our life of this world of this world and in doing so we will glorify Christ and his sacrifice that he made for us we must disown that tyrannical rule of our own self-centeredness and by laying aside our striving for advantage and security and pleasure and money and wealth and material stuff of the world and transferring that control of our life to Christ to bring life and joy. My point here is that people can only experience life and joy when they decide to make that choice, to die to self-centeredness, to die to the world existence and give their life over to Christ. 
Let us pray. Lord, we ask for a blessing on Pastor Terry as he gives his message this morning. And in doing so, convict our hearts for you. Open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive your word today and light a fire in us today, Lord Jesus, to bring your world and your promises to a very, very lost and dark world. Lord, enable us, empower us, embolden us to be your hands and feet. Embolden us to be the ones who plant the seeds that you will grow. You will make them prosper, and you will give them lifelong blessings of eternal life in you. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mark. I know how difficult that was for you this morning. Thank you for everyone that is here this morning in person and online. We're glad to see you all. And those of you that are online, we can see you there. We just can't see you, your bright and smiling faces from up here. But I know you're there, so welcome. This morning, we do continue our sermon series on the movie, Do You Believe? And this morning, we're talking about do something or doing something. And how important it is to uh, go from... Uh, or moving from a mindset where we don't do anything or we do nothing to where we do something. Basically going from refusing to act to acting. What Jesus did on the cross is just that. He didn't do nothing, he did something. He didn't refuse to act. In fact, in the garden, what did he pray? He prayed not my will, but yours, Father. He went from refusing, he didn't ever think about refusing to act as some of us might, he just acted. But he, he surrounded himself and he, he bathed in prayer. And for those of you that have been around a little while, you know that the name of our church is Grace Street Church, but the name of the ministry is Prayer, Care, Share Ministries. And before we do absolutely anything, we spend time in prayer. And so that's one of the things that we need to do. Before we do something, we need to pray about it. Because if we're doing something, we want it to be God's, not ours. And there's a difference there. In fact, when we do things for God, when we are doing things because we follow Jesus, there's a cost. Jesus paid the ultimate cost by giving his life up for us. You see, here's the thing. Salvation in and of itself is a free gift. Open it up. It's there for you. Take it. However, discipleship, which is the next step, which requires action, which requires us to do something. Well, listen to what Billy Graham said about that. He said, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost everything we have. So what does that look like? As I was preparing the message this morning, for this morning, I was reading about a guy, his name is Eric Cooper, and he and his wife went on a mission trip here now. Uh, too very long ago. They went with 13 students and a teacher from Covenant Christian High School in Indianapolis. And they went to Africa. And this is what he wrote about what their goal was. He said, our goal was to expose the students to the culture, history, and spiritual challenges of a region where the tectonic plates of Islam and Christianity are colliding every day. And this is how hard they collide. That area 99.9% .9 Muslim. They didn't shield the kids from that. In fact, they took the kids to a mosque where they met with and talked to the Imam. They went and talked to him. They wanted to understand. And then they went and met with a persecuted Christian pastor and his family. And I say persecuted because their church had been burned down three different times. 
they experienced the local culture, they met people, they, uh, they learned about the, the, the culture and the people, they ate the food there, and then, then they met a man who had given his life to Christ just three months prior to their trip, and this is his story. See, this man's father-in-law forcibly removed his pregnant wife from their home, saying he only gave him his, his daughter because he was a Muslim man, not a Christian. He has not seen or spoken to his wife since. His mother and brothers have locked him out of his home. And they took all of his possessions. He has nothing left. He was left only with the clothes on his back. And then his brothers threatened to stone him to death. A warning that even now could become a reality. But here's the thing. As he talked to those 13 students and, and Eric and his wife and that teacher, here's what this man said. He said, they have taken everything from me. What else can they possibly do? He was excited about his faith. He lost everything. He has nothing, but he has Jesus. And he is excited about that. And he's not worried about the next step because they can't do anything worse. Because if they do stone him to death, he knows where he's going for his eternity. But Here's the thing, we don't have to leave the United States to see persecution. It doesn't happen here nearly as much as it does around the world. But here's the thing, on April 20th of 1999, that date might sit with a few of you older folks here, that was the day that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold went into the Columbine High School out in Colorado and opened fire. Now, uh, here's, here's the thing. Eric and Dylan cornered Rachel Scott. And she was struggling to get away. And Eric asked her if she still believed in God. And when she tells him that she does, he shoots her. She was the first victim that day. But we don't have to go back 21 years. We can go back five or six years to October 1st, 2015 to Umpqua Community College where a 26-year-old student walked in and killed nine people, eight students and a professor. And here's a text message that a student sent to the publisher of the Roseburg Beacon News. The text said, the shooter was lining people up and asking if they were Christians. The message continued saying, if they said yes, then they were shot in the head. If they said no or didn't answer, they were shot in the leg. You see, we don't have to leave. There's persecution everywhere. Listen to our scripture this morning. As Christ lays out what the cost of discipleship is. If you have your Bibles... And I know they're not dusty because I keep telling you to take them out every week. And I know Mark does too. Turn to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to be reading through verses 34 through 38. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? If anything is anything worth more than your soul. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. It's mentioned also in Mark and Luke. This is a powerful statement that 
Jesus is giving us. You see, the thing is, is we have to let God lead. All too often we try to hold on to things. Now, I can think of things that are, have nothing to do with my faith, nothing to do with my, my spiritual walk. I can just go down into my basement, into our family room, which is now our uh, 350 square foot storage room, and look around going, yeah, we're holding on to things. Now, there's some things you do need to hold on to. Your tax returns, you need to hold on to those for life. But the different uh, documents that go with them, you can get rid of those after seven years. Receipts, go ahead and shred them. I can tell you a few years ago, we were going through boxes down there and we came across an 18 gallon tote. So, you know, it's about this wide, about yay deep, full of receipts. Going back to when we first met, most of them you couldn't read anymore because you know that thermal paper after a while, it just disappears. So what did we do? We went and got our shredder and just started shredding, getting rid of all that stuff that we don't need. And that's what we need to do in our life. We've got to quit hanging on to things that don't mean anything. You know, you can gather up all you want in this world, but if it has, it brings no glory to God, and quite frankly, the thing... You're not going to take anything. There's a story of a guy who tells his wife, when I die, I need you to put my wealth in the casket with me. I want to die with my money so I can take it with me. Just before they close the casket, she put a check in the casket. You can't take it with you. And in a moment, we're going to watch a clip from a movie that shows what commitment to God really is. And in this clip, and it, for those of you that have seen the movie, um, I'm not going to ruin the whole movie for you. I'm just going to tell you about a little piece of it that kind of sets the stage for part of the movie. Uh, Bobby, who's an EMT, is discussing with his wife, Elena, the consequences of leading a dying man to the Lord while he was on an emergency call. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, just visualize this. This man is laying on the ground and there's this giant steel drum and, and it's probably six, eight foot tall, and is laying right across his midsection and down across his legs. And he's slowly losing consciousness and he's about to die. Bobby has done absolutely everything in his power to help this man and make him comfortable, but without a, some kind of heavy equipment to move that that large drum, there was nothing more he could do. So he took that moment and he prayed with him. And in that moment, he reached into his pocket and he had a cross from the last worship service that he had gone to. And he took that cross and as he prayed with the man, he put it in his hand. And the man asked him what it was and he told him it was a cross. And he asked him if he believed in Jesus. And that man genuinely turned his life over to Christ. But here's the thing. He and his wife were uh, card-carrying members of the humanist society. They didn't believe in God. Or at least he didn't think he did before that moment. And so when she goes over to her dead husband after that and finds that cross, she ooze the department and the city. And since the department and the city wipe their hands of it. The, the, even the firefighters union distances themselves from him. They won't support him because he won't recant. He won't say he's sorry for doing what he knew was right. And in this clip, Elena's not happy. To say the least, it's going to be a very significant cost. They could lose their home. They could be homeless. They could lose everything they have. And she is upset with him. Let's go ahead and play that clip.
You're willing to risk everything. I'm not trying to prove a point. I'm trying to be faithful. You were. The guy's safe in heaven now. Thanks to you and Jesus. End of story. Sure, he is. What about the next guy? I spoke with Tom's friend, Steve Katz. He's willing to represent me, but he's asking for a retainer. 20,000. Where are we gonna get that kind of money from, Bobby? We have one month's mortgage in a checking account, and all of our cards are maxed out. I don't know, but I trust God will provide a way. Bobby, we're not in church. I need to know where the money's gonna come. Especially when you insist in tithing and every nickel we make. Tell me, where's it gonna come from? I can't do this anymore. What do you want me to do? Sign a statement. Apologize. Do whatever people want you to do. Or what? Or what, Elena? Bobby is not about to let anything come between him and his relationship with Jesus. He knows there's a cost. And in this clip, we see the tension that's building between him and his wife. He also had a very tension-filled conversation with his boss, who is the one that told him, the city's not going to back you, the department's not going to back you, the union's not going to back you. But he's willing to risk it all, his job, his home, and his family. I found this, uh, this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer from a book that he wrote called The Cost of Discipleship. And if you want to read about discipleship, this is an amazing book to read. But on uh, pages 192 and 183, he wrote this, the life of discipleship can only be maintained so long as nothing is allowed to come between Christ and ourselves, neither the law, nor personal piety, nor even the world. The disciple always looks only to his master, never to Christ and the law, or Christ and religion, or Christ and the world. He avoids all such notions like the plague only by following Christ alone. Can he persevere, or can he preserve a single eye? So here's the thing. All this leads up to our, the first point today. It, it, it's time to take up our cross. Now, if we go to, to Mark, we're going and, and we're gonna to start, and we're just going to break this down verse by verse here. And we're going to start with Mark 34. And, and earlier I read, if any of you wants to be my follower. Now think of that as uh, my disciple, as Jesus is saying that. You must turn from your selfish way. So we have to set aside any of our personal and our selfish interests. And we have to take up our cross. So he says, take up your cross. And what does that mean? That means expressing a willingness to endure whatever is to come. And then he says, and follow me. And that means we have to believe in him. We have to conform to his example in living and if need be in suffering. And maybe even to the point of dying because of our faith in Jesus. Now this brings up a, a very vivid image of Christ dying on the cross. And we're not... You know, we just got done with Christmas. We're not that far from the beginning of the Lenten season. Ash Wednesday is coming up fairly quickly. And before we know it, Easter will be here. So when we think about death on the cross, Jesus is, and it's used by Jesus because those who were listening knew that it was meant for dangerous criminals. And they knew how awful a death it was. And, and by, so by saying, carrying your own cross is signifying submission. 
because the Romans would make the prisoner carry their own cross in submission to their power. So this is a metaphorical statement by him, and, and it means it's talking about our faithfulness, and it requires us to extend that faithfulness even to death. Now Mark um, chapter 15, verse 21, we get a, a bigger picture of taking up the cross. And it says this, a passerby named Simon, who was from, from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And then there, Mark puts a little side note that's not in any of the other Gospels. He said, Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. I'll come back to that here in a moment. But whether Simon was a follower of Jesus is not really readily known. We don't know that for sure. Now, what we do know, going back to Alexander and Rufus, that last little piece there, his sons were likely known to the readers, Mark's readers, as leaders in the early church. So they would have known the name, and therefore that's why he put that reference there. And it's uh, because it was written so much closer to the time frame. The other two Gospels um, have this in it. It's further along, and so those two names might not make as big of a powerful punch as it did when Mark wrote it. So that's why it's not marked in there. And interestingly, John Piper says this uh, about Simon carrying Jesus' cross. He said, carrying the cross behind Jesus is a beautiful and painful picture of our calling as disciples. And he also says, the call to suffer for Jesus is often sudden and costly and seemingly random. That's what it was for Bobby in our, our clip. When he prayed for this man and with this man, it was just a sudden, he heard God say it, he, he followed, he did it. He was obedient. But what came after that was very quickly, quick as well. It became very costly and, very ran, and it was very random. And then uh, John Piper also says, Simon's help proved to be both a relief temporarily so Jesus didn't have to carry that, that weight because he was probably to the point of dying. If he had to carry it all the way up, he probably would have died on the road there. So he got a temporary relief. And then he goes on and he says, but also added suffering because it sustained Jesus to get to the cross and have the horrible experience of crucifixion for us. So ultimately, Simon carrying that crossbeam for Jesus makes it so that the scriptures that predicted, that, that prophesied what would happen to Jesus made sure that it did happen. And it was random. They pulled him out of nowhere and, and shoved him into service. Now, that sounds like a lot of well, not a lot of pleasure in doing that. and probably didn't get a lot of enjoyment out of it. And it certainly didn't make him happy because he was forced to do something he didn't want to do. But Jesus is not saying here that we shouldn't be happy or that we shouldn't enjoy life or that we shouldn't have a pleasurable life. But it is also not saying that we should seek pain needlessly. Here's the problem. With the pull of the world... It takes effort to follow Jesus. It takes effort when we're pulled into situations like that. And it means doing his will, no matter what, regardless of what the future looks like. Bobby, regardless of what the future looked like in that moment, he followed God's leading and he led that man to Christ. Regardless of what the future consequences might be, what that future would like. And taking up our cross means we are giving up control. And by giving up control, think of it like this. It's a death that leads to a whole new life. So we're dying to our old life and being presented with a new life in Christ. It also means that you must, and this is our second point today, you must lose your claim. Let's talk about that a little bit. 
Uh, first, let's go to Mark 8.35, where it says, if you try to hang on to your life, and he's talking about in this world, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. You will, in other words, you will save it from the consequences of sin and separation from God. So we must lose our claim to this life. We have to give up our selfish ambition. That selfish ambition contains so many things. Just some of them are like the sin that's in our lives. Or self-satisfaction. Or um, giving up control. We can't always be in control. And if we're clinging to our own life, it's like we're keeping our life from Jesus. We aren't giving it to him. We're keeping it from him. And that means we will lose it in the next life, in the eternal life. So losing it means letting Jesus lead. And if we're letting Jesus lead, that means we are going to be sprung into action and do something. And we're going to spread the gospel. And this will save your life. Now, one of the hardest things, and, and Mark and I were talking this morning um, and sharing, he was sharing with me the, the death of his friend. And it got me to thinking about people who I had shared the gospel with, who had not accepted Christ. And there's a guilt that can run in your mind because of that. Uh, kick Satan out, because when you are sharing, you are doing God's work. If that person chooses not to accept that, that's on them, not on you. If that man had not chosen to choose Christ as Bobby was praying with him, that would have been on that man and not on Bobby. And here's the, here's the benefit, because there's always pluses and minuses, everything, but if we lose our life and we let Jesus lead and we start spreading the gospel and our life is saved, then nothing, nothing in this life will compare to what we will gain in eternity. Now, in this morning in the call to worship, uh, I really was drawn to add in that extra scripture that Mark used, but God said, I need you to leave that out. And it wasn't until this morning when we talked that I knew why. Because that was Mark's to do, not mine. So I'm going to go just to verses 25 and 26 out of John 12 and, and just read through it. And I'm going to add a little bit to that. So uh, those who love their life in this world, so think of this is, will be eventually, will lose it. And at some point we all die. We can't avoid death. The problem is that sometimes people go too soon. In this past week, I know two people who passed away, and Mark had a good friend pass away. One of those people was only 52. That gets me thinking because I'm older than that. And it, and it starts to hit, and it starts to play in my mind. But we don't live forever. And John goes on and writes, those who care nothing for their life in this world, and that's because they are more concerned about pleasing God and doing what God wants, Jesus continues and said, we will keep it for eternity. So they will keep their life for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me, Jesus says, must follow me. So we have to faithfully continue. It's not something we can just do. It's not a one-time thing. This is a life change. This is how we live our lives after that. And we must follow him. And we must do it without hesitation. We have to uh, faithfully hold on to Jesus. We have to follow the example that he gives us. And he gives us the example in this book. And yes, there may be suffering and even dying because of our faith in him. And Jesus tells us that in the scriptures. He doesn't mince words. And then he continues and says, because my servants must be where I am. And where he, he says where I am, he's speaking of in heaven's glory. And this passage finishes and says, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now, earlier I mentioned Joyce Scott. Prior to her death, and, and this is one of the movies we were actually talking about, 
I'm not ashamed is the story of her life ever her uh, life just before this all happened and then what happens um, she was getting pulled back and forth she was being pulled into the world and then she would see where she was at and she would go back to God and she'd get pulled into the world and then she went back and this happened over the course of a couple of years where she was back and forth that of course she was rebelling against her parents and authority but before April of 1999 she got rid of that absorption in in the worldly interests because ultimately they did backfire on her and there were worldly consequences she went and sought God with a fervor and it was in serving Jesus that she showed her faith and ultimately paid the ultimate sacrifice for that. But she found her bliss. She found her joy in Christ. And she now resides with him in heaven. So that brings us to our next point. We need to find our bliss. So I would challenge you to find your bliss. And when I say bliss, I mean find your joy. Where does your joy come from? My joy comes from the Lord. Sounds like scripture. Oh, wait, it is. There's joy in the Lord. So let's go to the last three verses from this passage in Mark 8. And it says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? Now let's think with all its pleasures, with all its sin, with everything. But lose your own soul, Jesus says. Is anything more than your, or is anything worth more than your soul? And he is inferring eternal life in God's kingdom. If anyone is ashamed, and he's talking about in the here and now, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So what do you put all your energy into pursuing? I used to be, well, I'm a recovering workaholic. I struggle because I like, I work, I, I tend to work hard. That's what I used to put all my energy into. And it cost me other things. I paid consequences for it. What are you pursuing? Is it possessions? Is it power? Is it stature? Is it wealth? What is it that you are pursuing? Because those things, they're hollow. And they're temporary. What Jesus is talking about in this passage, he's talking about our souls. Those are eternal. And we have to make a choice. Is anything worth our soul? Listen to what the psalmist writes in Psalm 49, 7 and 9. He says, Yet they cannot redeem themselves from death by paying a ransom to God. Redemption does not come so easily, for no one can ever pay enough to live forever and never see the grave. Redemption can't be bought. It can't. Jim Elliott said this. He said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Losing your soul means you're going to lose the benefits in our next life, in our eternal life. I'm, that's, 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 be, that's bigger and better than my 401k, my rock, any of that could ever be. That stuff's going to go up and down, eventually it'll go away. It'll, it'll get spent by somebody, whether it's Diane and I that spend it or we give it to the kids after we pass. It'll go away. It's, it's temporary. But the benefits of the next life, that's what we need to be pursuing. And, and here's what it says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Jesus tells us, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. See, this is in the context of the trials and the misfortune and the misery and the suffering. This is how, uh, how we live our lives. 
How do we choose to live them? And, and the first two people that came to mind as, as I'm thinking about this were Judas and Peter. Both denied Christ. But both had very different outcomes. Judas never repented and ultimately went out and hung himself. Whereas Peter, he realized what he did wrong. And he sought the Lord. And later in the Gospels, we read about Peter being forgiven by Jesus. So that leads us to the next point. You can secure your future. In other words, you can secure your future in heaven. So I'm going to go to James uh, chapter 2, verse 14 for this one. And it says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that f kind of faith save anyone? Now, in this passage, James is prodding the people into action because they're not, they're not doing anything with their faith. They, uh, they're being kept from a genuine faith. See, actions alone don't carry on your faith. It makes faith incomplete. Scripture tells us that even the demons know truth. Even the demons know the truth. So, how does that play in? Well, their actions are still rebellious. And they're against a commitment to God. They have fallen to the lies of Satan. And that's probably why the scriptures tell us that the demons at this name of Jesus shudder. They shudder. They, it's like, why have you come? They, they, want, they don't want anything to do with him. They're, they're afraid of him. They don't want any part of him because they're blinded. And part of that is probably because faith takes a commitment. Now, when I go back to thinking of doing something, doing something requires a commitment, right? So if our actions are rebellious, then we are rebellious against that commitment to God. How long do you think that'll last? Think of it this way. Marriage is a commitment as well. If you don't do anything beyond the point of uh, wooing your, your better half, your spouse, before you get married, and, and if you don't do anything beyond, uh, if, you're, if you're the one that gave the ring, and if you don't do anything beyond the wedding, you're not committed. And what's going to happen to that marriage? It's going to fall apart. So if we're not committed to God, what's going to happen? A relationship with him will fall apart and we'll get drawn back into the world. So I want to be clear because I don't, I don't want anybody to think I'm saying that actions save us. It's faith. Actions simply reflect our faith. They reflect our commitment. It means that we agree with the things that Jesus taught us. And he didn't teach us to sit around and do nothing. Because what did he do? He was always out amongst the people. He was healing. He was teaching. He was always doing something. That is why genuine faith then produces action. True faith or genuine faith is transforming. It transforms our thoughts. It transforms our behaviors. It, it, it changes what we do. When we take a stand for Jesus, sometimes the only defense that we will have is in Jesus. And standing for the truth can be, as Bobby found out, very difficult and very lonely. 
People who are seeking bliss or joy or contentment are simply looking to be fulfilled. They're trying to fill a hole in their heart. Christ is the ultimate fulfilling of our purpose in our hearts and in our lives. Now, many of you probably know it's very difficult to give up to control of anything to anyone else. I can remember a time when I told Diane she was folding the towels wrong. Uh, she eventually uh, proved to me why I was wrong. Because I was folding the towels the way that my mom taught me. Right? Well, the way I folded the towels, they don't fit in the closet, in the hallway closet very well. There's extra space and, and they just don't all fit in there. But if we fold them the way that Diane has showed me to fold them, they fit perfectly. Over time, I didn't actually admit to being wrong, but I changed what I was doing. We have to change what we're doing. We have to live a different life and we have to sacrifice. And here's the thing, um, we're sitting in, you know, those of you here in person, we're sitting in this building with four walls on it and it is a church building. Those of you that are home might be in your living room. You might be in, hey, you might even be watching on your phone in bed. That's what the pandemic has done. That's okay. Because the church isn't these four walls has nothing to do with the four walls. It's a blessing to be able to meet in here. But it goes beyond that. Church is way beyond that. We proved that at Thanksgiving when we did the meals for Rem. We proved that when we have our movies and our orange track racing and as we're looking for ways to reach out to our community because we don't want to sit here and do nothing. We want to be productive. And sometimes those closest to us can challenge our faith in very unproductive ways because they may be so wrapped up in what the world says is important. See, we have to lose to find. And that's hard to wrap your head around. That's counterintuitive. You have to lose to find. That doesn't make sense, but letting go of control gives greater control to our master, gives greater control to Jesus. And that faith in doing that, it requires us to go into action. It requires movement, a response. Otherwise, it's just knowledge rattling around in our heads. So let me ask you this. As we prepare to, to wind down the message this morning, what action do you need to take this week? I'm going to just leave it at that. What action do you need to take this week? And I'm, I'm, I'm not asking for anybody to, to shout out an answer. I'm, I'm always comfortable in the uncomfortable, awkward silence. But is there something worldly, some worldly thing that you're holding on to right now? And then I would also challenge you to this. Encourage a friend or family member to keep or to make a commitment to Jesus. And each of us have different ways to do it. Some of us are, are very outspoken and, and, and extroverts, and other of us would just as soon talk to some, well, like my brother did in, in the Christmas pageant when he was about this tall. He walked up with his three by five card, got up in front of everybody, walked up to the microphone, read his card, and went and sat down. He's not an introvert anymore. But how we reach others, we do in our own way. We each have our own gifts. And so we have to lose to find. We have to die to live. We have to live a life of faith. And that's going to require sacrifice. It requires us letting go of control and trusting God to handle things. Bobby was trusting God to handle the cost of the lawyer. I don't know about y'all, but $20,000 is a lot of money to, to sign a retainer for. He probably would have had to have put another mortgage on his house. 
But that cost went beyond that money. It went to relationships. So as you think about today's message over the next week, and what it means to find your life by losing it, find small ways. So start small. Find small ways to give up control. Maybe it means you don't run the remote to the TV all week when you're watching TV with the family. Something small. Give it up. Release control. And maybe you'll save some money that you could spend on something else. Maybe you could save some money that you could bless someone else. Blessing someone who is less fortunate. And I saw that this week, and I was blessed by it. Maybe, instead of watching TV, you'll flip off the TV, and you'll pick up your Bible. Or maybe, you'll pick up a devotional and read it with your spouse or your family. Maybe, just maybe, the next time you go out in public, socially distance at the restaurant, instead of just ordering your food and eating it, you'll join hands. Or you, maybe you don't even have to join hands. But you'll pray over your meal, and you won't mutter it. You'll say it. Proudly. You don't have to shout it. You don't have to make it so everyone in the whole place hears you. But maybe you'll pray over that meal. Giving up control. Because the first time I did that, tell you what, it was pretty uncomfortable. Second time was pretty uncomfortable. Two dozen times later, it got a little easier. And now we don't even think about it. So... Are you just involved with Jesus? Or are you fully committed to Jesus? And when I think of fully committed, I, I think of, we're on this restaurant kicking food. Um, there's a, it's called Firehouse Subs. They, if it's fully committed, it has everything on it. They, it it's everything, it's all in. So when I think of this, are we involved with Jesus? So, yeah, we read our Bible. And we pray. But are you fully committed? Are you in 100%? Are you committed fully to Christ? And if we are, then that leads us to the last point. We must die to live in order to do something. Now next week, Pastor Mark will be bringing us a message about what happens when we do the wrong thing. And the defining moments that come our way. Pray with me. Thank you, Father God, for sending your son Jesus. You sent him to love us, to heal us, and to forgive us. Jesus lived and died for our sins. My sins and your sins. And as long as the song, and as the song says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because, so, Father, because your son, Jesus, lives, we can all face tomorrow. Thank you, Father, for that. Help us to continue to grow in our faith, to be committed to doing something by living out our faith every moment of every day. And Father, as we each take up our own cross and follow Jesus, we know it will be forever worth it. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into this time of communion in here, it's a time for us to remember that sacrifice that Christ made. And, and I'll borrow from Terry's last statements that he had in here. See, Christ was fully committed. He was all in. 
He gave it all for us. He gave it all so that we could have that relationship with God. It was a restoration. And more than that, it was a blessing of salvation. See, because without that death on the cross, we wouldn't have the restoration with God. We'd still be separated with our sin. And without him being fully committed on the cross, we don't have salvation. We don't have salvation. Through that mighty act of love, through that fully committed act of Jesus Christ, we are blessed with salvation. We're blessed with restoration in our relationship with God. We need to make sure that we honor him, and we honor him each and every time that we take communion. We remember that sacrifice. As it says across the front of this, do this in remembrance of me. He was fully committed to us. We need to be fully committed to Christ. All in. All in. On the night that he was given up, he took bread and he broke it and he said to the disciples, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, he took the cup and after he filled it and after he blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And each time that you take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. We need to do this in remembrance that he was fully committed to us. He went all what are we holding back today? What are we holding back from being fully committed to Christ? The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. of our time our prayers with people and our praises prayers and praises that uh, we would like to share with one another this time. good morning everyone how are we this morning <laughs> good does anybody have anything they'd like to share with me this morning before we start praying? Well, um, I guess we'll we'll think of Mark and his, his friend that he's lost and Terry and two friends that he's lost. And, and uh, you know, each day is kind of tough to get through some days. Um, I know you've lost many friends this year and last year, and um, I'm so sorry, but you know, God is so good. He, he gets you through it all. And the way he gets us through this all is to read the word, like they have said. And, you know, this is fuel. God gives us fuel every day to read, every morning. Last night, I was just having a time. We, we had to put our kitty down this weekend, and that was tough for me. And, and um, I really, I was depressed, and I was very sad. And this morning, I got up, and I was reading his word, and... And he showed me, you know, in Matthew 6, do not worry, for he gives us everything through his word. And, uh, you know, I should not be depressed. I come here and you people have lost friends. That's more important than a cat. But uh, it's very hard anyway. But uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> God just laid that on my heart this morning. And I thank you, Mark and Terry, that, that you are such ambassadors for for God because you come to work you come here you read your word before you come you read your word every morning 
He fuels our hearts and our souls. God fuels us with his word. So let us just go to God in, in prayer. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for Mark and Terry, for being so good at sharing the news that you give them. And thank you for always being there for us, no matter what, no matter what we're going through, Lord Jesus. Oh, some days are just hard to get through, and uh, it doesn't matter what it is. We're human, and we all have emotions, and these emotions must be checked sometimes. And sometimes to do that, we just need to get into your word and read it and make it come alive in our hearts and our souls, in our spirit. For you are God and you love us so much that you died on the cross for us. Help us to show up for you each and every day, Lord Jesus. For you are a great God and worthy of praise. And I thank you for all that you are. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. Now, for those of you that are online, we're preparing to close out that part of our service. But stay watching or stay in the comments because um, we'll be putting some videos up or links to videos on YouTube for you to also be able to worship from home with the music that we're going to be uh, singing here. Um, one of them is about setting our hearts on fire. It's a Brit Nicole song. And then uh, there's another one about I Will Follow, uh, Chris Tomlin, of course. And there's one that, um, it's totally escaping me, but the one that's top of mind, the one that I had, we had to have today, there's a, a, a song out there called Do Something. So we'll be singing those. But think about how those affect us and, and what God is calling us to do, both through the message and through the music. And here's a passage from Hebrews, chapter 13, 20 and 21, that I, I want you to think about. This is a great uh, benediction verses, and it says this, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory in heaven and all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, help us to daily do the best that we possibly can, to be the best witness to our families, Father, to our friends and to our co-workers, our neighbors, and, and anyone and everyone that we might cross paths with. Father, we know that the things of this world will try to pull us away from you. And you have already given us the strength to get through them. Guide us, Father. Help us to make the right decisions. And Father, I pray right now that no matter what is happening in anyone's life, that we will always turn to you in prayer first, and that we will never, ever, ever be ashamed to make known that we are your children. And all God's children said, Amen. Go in peace. Thank you for joining us.